Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, this is the greatest time of the day. From the center of the universe, New York City, it's the main event you've been waiting for. It's time to go in the cage with Cyclone! And your Messiah is back in your life. Where else am I going? Eh. But guess what? It is not raining. And guess, guess what? First time. 33 shows. First time in studio guests. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, right off the bat, got to bring up one of the big men, I could say, <laughs> over at the ISKA, Tom Skinoza. How you doing? How are you? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. It's an honor. A lot of fun. It, it's an honor for me to actually have you here. I, I really, really appreciate it. So, right off the bat, how did you get started at the ISKA? Well, that, that's, uh, I guess, the, the, the truth of the matter was um, I had my sights set on becoming commissioner of the New York State Athletic Commission. I had, uh, there was a petition that was started to get somebody in there. And uh, a couple thousand signatures went in and became bigger than I had imagined. Um, and David Berlin had interviewed, interviewed me for the position. At the time, MMA was just becoming legal, and they were creating this thing. And I met with him and John Salgado and Eric, Eric Bentley and uh, got the nod. And um, in the last minute, it didn't happen. So... I was like, wow. But uh, Corey Schaefer, the president of the ISK, and I had been friends for a long time, and he, I, there was a need for a new sanctioning body in New York. And ISK, 300 shows in 10 countries around the world, uh, he had asked me if I'd be interested. And he would have brought the sanctioning to New York on the condition that it was me. And um, it turned out to be a lot bigger than I anticipated. Um, and now, first full year this year, um, on December 14th, I have two shows. I have the Triton MMA, the Space in Westbury, and I have Friday Night Fights um, at the at the bar, um, Fort Street Ballroom, and that'll bring us up to 38 shows this year. So we just became uh, a lot bigger than I had thought it would be, but I run with it. We regulate Bellator. We regulate Glory. I was supposed to be in uh, Japan next, next week for karate combat and we did that show at the uh on the 102nd floor of the freedom tower so this is the you know we're we're doing these amazing shows i'm thrilled uh, to be a part of it and be a part of the more important part um doing it the right way uh, the the official they just spent the weekend at the new york state athletic commission um kevin mcdonald did a certification of referees and uh and judges and uh I had the ISK team there, so we're we're raising the bar on the officials, on, and we don't want to hear that people have been robbed, and, and you hear it way too often, and uh, take it out of the judges' hands. Well, if you've got two well-matched fighters, I mean, really well-matched, it is in the judges' hands. You know, if if you're if you're going to show and it's like knockout after knockout, you have to wonder maybe the matchups weren't that great. So uh, we're we're pretty thrilled with what's going on. I'm, I'm very proud of the people that I'm, I'm in, uh, that are working on my ISK team. Uh, I did four shows two weeks ago in the same weekend. We did Rage in the Cage in uh, Rochester. We did Gladius in Syracuse. I had uh, Joe Puglio's Top Kick Super Fights and Radisson and Hoppog, and Friday Night Throwdown in L.A., which uh, is, is another story that we could talk about. Now, <clears throat> if you have all these events at the same time, mm -hmm. 
not necessarily, but same day. You as one of the top dogs, how do you decide which one you're going to, you know, That's go a, to? It's a good question, and it really depends, you know, um, what's going on in, in this particular instance. Uh, I went up to Syracuse um, as it was our first show with them, so it was important for me to be there. And generally speaking, I've, I've been doing this for the last, uh, I've been in the martial arts the last 48 years. I've been uh, with uh, officiating for the last 15 or so, not including boxing, and that goes back to about 20 years. But um, I know the promoters. I've either fought on their card, uh, I've either had my fighters on their card, or I've officiated on their cards. I know, um, and then I also know when I have a show and, I, and I'm putting Chris Wagner as, as my rep and I know my officials, I don't have to worry about it. The shows pretty much I, um, run themselves in terms from the ISK point of view. I have people that I, I depend on and they never let me down. So I'm pretty, I have a great, great team. So, so what, what's a typical day like for you? A lot of paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing, like today, I spent most of my day, I have two, two shows coming up um, next Friday. And one's an MMA show, that's uh, Triton. And the other one is a Muay Thai show. So, but he, they both require blood work, medicals for the fighters. So we've already gotten past the, the original, where you submit the 10 day notice to the New York State Athletic Commission, the fight card, I'm looking, I've already approved the matchups. Um, and now it's a matter of making sure that everybody has their meds in, their blood work, their meds, and make sure that the insurance company send me the paperwork so I know we have that. Um, I actually get very involved in assigning the physicians so I know who they are. I'm also sending the blood work and the medicals to the physicians in a drop box. They're approving them. They're, you know, make sure that um, the hep B, surface antigen, hep C, antibody, HIV, everything is done correctly because you'll have blood work come back. And today, as a matter of fact, I was looking at one, it was hep B antibody. I can't approve that. They have to go back and redo the test. Hep B antibody, it's nothing. It tells me you've got a vitamin deficiency. The surface antigen tells me you've got something that another fighter has to worry about. Hep C, big one. I and mean, uh, if, if it's not correct, you know, you're not only you know, at risk yourself, but you're not, you know, you've got a problem. You're at risk, uh, you're putting the other, your opponent at risk and um, the referee. We just went through this. Uh, I um, sanctioned Kasai, which is uh, an amazing uh, grappling. Some of the best grapplers and uh, jiu-jitsu in the world coming, you know, ex-former or current UFC Bellator, um, top, top people, black belts, and Really, if you're into BJJ, and I, that's one of one of the things I have a passion. I'm passionate about. One of the main event guys te tested positive for Hep C, and it turned out it, it it was something that was in his blood. Whether you you know you're born with some type of uh, blood thing, but we needed uh, we needed further confirmation from an infectious disease doctor that he can't um, put anybody else at risk, and so we had to we had to stop that fight. And that's huge. But, I mean, if you don't do this stuff, you don't want to be part of that show. And too, too much going, and that's why I'm really happy with being part of the ISK, because up till now, there, were too, there was too much rubber stamping going on. The, to, to, you know, you can't put fighters at risk, you know, the, their future, their lives, um, what they go home, bring to their wives and children, you know. So we... we, uh, we do what we have to do to keep it 100% um, safe for the fighters. That's our number one issue. If that's good, what would you say is the most frustrating part for you? That, that <laughs> just you, 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 you want to swing at somebody. Again, um, getting the medicals in on time. I mean, we can't do this two days before. I can't take their blood work and their medicals at the weigh-in. This is your job. This is what you do for a living. Get it done. As it is, blood work's good for six months unless there's a fight in between and then you've been at risk or whatever. Um, but, you know, medicals are good for a year. Get it done. If you're an amateur and you want to advance your career, this is your responsibility. And the, uh, so many fighters just, 
don't take it seriously enough and they delay and they wait or I look at it and I just sent it today to the uh, to the promoter that uh, one fighter's um, one fighter his blood work was outdated get it done get it done go get it we can have it within 24 to 48 hours you can go to a, I can send you to a lab I can get you a prescription from a doctor the script to go get it done so it comes back to me that's oh, good you're good for six more months and they won't do it to me that's frustrating and, and yeah I know the the old days they, they say oh we don't need it even in even in yeah that was the big big thing with the, with the rise of all these jujitsu tournaments you know guess what <laughs> it's unarmed combat this is it nobody well most guys that are, that at that level jujitsu also fight whether it's stand up k1 glory you know whatever or you do an mma you're still exposing yourself to this stuff so um you have to get it done you know it's, it's not just grappling it's on arm combat you know. now, i understand the toughness and the toughness has to be done you got to draw the line in the sand but is there a gray area where, where you might say Okay, I, I I might let this slide just slightly, just <laughs> just this once. No, <laughs> no, no, no. You're not fighting. I don't care how you think it's yourself. Um, ISK is is just too reputable, too big, and if you're advancing your career um, from one of the local shows that that are going to put you into the UFC, into Bellator. Um, Learn from day one the right way to do things. That's the most important thing. Learn good habits early in your career. I don't care what you do for a living. You know, bad habits will follow you your entire career. Uh, the good habits, well, this is what you do. Now, it's funny how you brought up the whole thing with officiating and hearing what the officials hear. Is there a way? Especially after this weekend, and it, I'm happy to I'm happy to have you because you, I think you know where I'm going to go with yeah, this. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I sat there as, as a combat sports journalist, mm -hmm. and yeah, Fury got knocked down twice, but the majority of the rounds, at least in my eyes, under what boxing's guidance rules mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. He really should have won. Even if you scored, if you gave Wilder three 10-8 rounds, and I only gave him two, the, the sixth right. and the, the twelfth, the ninth and the twelfth, it still shouldn't have, maybe I could see the draw, but that the first judge, 115-111 the other way, mm -hmm. The first six rounds for Wilder, how can, how can there be such a big difference? Even if, if two, even if they're calling it 10 10 rounds, mm -hmm. and one is seeing something completely different for, for six rounds, how is that possible? It's not. Unfortunately, it's, it's something that I am working very hard to, to change, um, and that is just raising the bar for my officials to be to be on spot on the mind. In in the I can answer to the um, what I'm doing now as compared to where it used to be done yet yeah, in the um, martial arts and you know, whether it's uh, kickboxing or MMA. Three judges. Three judges to do twelve, fifteen fights in a night is it, it won't happen. It just and I'm sorry. Uh, I tell the promoters I'm putting on putting on minimum of four. There has to be a break because that one judge that's sitting there watching that first shot, first fight is not going to be a sharp watching, you know, in his thirty sixth round of the right. of the twelfth. So you've got to constantly, you know, move your refs, your judges around so that they're they're rested and they've had time to breathe. But in in, in instances where there's just something's de you know, definitely wrong with this picture. If I'm sitting there and uh, I see some, you know, Judge A, Judge B, 30-27, Judge C, 30, for A, and then Judge, you know, the third judge is 30-27 for B, you know, for the blue corner, it happens. But if it happens more than once in the course of a night, I'm, I'm pulling that guy out of his chair and just having him sit by me for a little bit and I'm replacing him and we're going to talk about it. You know what what's going on? You're having a bad night. It's okay. 
everybody has a bad night with your referee. <laughs> Everybody's been booed from the top, from Big John to Big Dan to everybody's had their moments that they wish didn't happen, but uh, it happens. Yeah, it's just, See, and, and I would even think it's tougher for an MMA ref or an MMA judge mm -hmm. because there's a lot more. Uh, let's face it, boxing is just one, yeah. two. MMA, you have on the ground, you have stand up, you have this, you ha have submissions. You ha mm -hmm. They have to have their eyes so much more. Well, not only that, but give you an example. This weekend, the uh, certification that goes on, and, and it's, it's usually um, certification like uh, Kevin McDonald, Robert Hines, you know, Big Dan, that, that do the same course. You take it, and you're sitting there and you're watching literally a quick video uh, of something going on and you've got to write down what it was whether it be the, the submission leading up to it so that you know what to what to expect you know you're not you're not judging somebody on what they've done you're you're judging them on the effect of what they just did and so when you are sitting there with a you know was 8 a.m to 5 p.m and you're doing written tests you're doing you're doing the videos, you're scoring, um, and then you're doing the practical part. If you're a referee, show me that, you know, so that you know what to expect. Um, so if you want to be a ref or even a judge, you, you, you really have to have a background in the, diff in the various disciplines. You have to know what submissions are. You have to know. You, you, a big thing, a lot of my friends, because I'm USA Boxing also, you know, wanted to come over, make that transition. You could be a great boxing ref to come into the cage where now you're, you've got to anticipate and you've got to understand when somebody's about to pass out, when somebody's going to not only tap, but you've got to know when something's going to break, snap, tear. You know, that only comes from years of experience, and uh, it's hard for them to make that transition. And the same thing with judging. You have to know what you're looking at. You know, so I have to question when, when things get that bad, you know, what was that person looking at? <laughs> and and, uh, and you have to wonder about their future. And we've gone through this in Vegas with other major fights and people that it shouldn't be put on those type of fights that big. Boxing is more of it than, uh, than the combat, than the martial arts. Now, I know Frank Trigg studied mm -hmm. under John McCarthy. Mm -hmm. So... Not to rubber stamp it, but if he's going to study under John, and John's, if you're going to say the best of all time, mm -hmm. let's just say, you pretty much can rubber stamp, okay, this guy's safe, he's going to know what he's doing, mm -hmm. pretty much. When someone like Chris Lieben just retires mm -hmm. and then steps in to ref, is it a good thing to have fighters jump in so fast after retirement to... to uh, again, that, that's, that's a great question, and a great fighter doesn't automatically make you a great official, and we've seen that in, in the past where somebody who outstanding black belt in jiu-jitsu, great, he did fairly, fairly well in the UFC and whatnot, terrible, terrible official, you know, and, and it's the same thing with... Um, being being a great official, you don't necessarily have to have been. I, I you know I know one of my friends, one of the guys that works for me is, is an amazing official, but he's never really trained. You know, and, and that's okay. You could be a fan of the sport and be very knowledgeable about what you're looking at as a judge, and and it works. So to answer your question, no, I don't think it's a matter of time. It's a matter. I. I are you qualified? I would rather see them shadow. I'd rather see them, you know, start out on an undercard and, and just see that they're comfortable in the way they move, the way they anticipate what's going on. It takes a lot to be to be a really good ref. I mean, I, and I've seen a lot of guys with a great great deal of heart and <laughs> just and knowledge, and I've known them, and unfortunately, <laughs> I can't, you know, I, I, I can't use them, you know, because then it... It just creates a problem. Yeah. See, it's funny how you say heart because that's gonna that actually segues into the next question. Um, I don't. I wouldn't imagine someone of your stature has to deal with Dana White. 
you know, and 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 Dana is a hot tempered guy. Mm -hmm. He sh which in a way is good because he shoots from his hip. He he doesn't you know mm -hmm. hold back, a and for most people it's a good thing. But if he says something to the effect of, "A oh, Mario Yamasaki, never again in one of my octagons mm -hmm. ever." He can't really call that shot. That's up to you guys, right? To say. Well, that, that's your gray area that you mentioned before. <laughs> um, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. Because here's the deal. I know dealing, yeah. you know, you're with, deal with Bellator. Scott Coker is not the, the, the hothead to in front of guys like me in, in, yeah. in a media room. He might take you to the side. Hey, look, this guy's a little shaky now. Something's mm -hmm. going on. Pull him aside. Dana in front of... The whole entire media world. Mm -hmm. This guy's gone. Yeah, that that's wrong, and it's unfortunate that it happens. I'm I'm proud to say one of my closest friends is is Steve Mazzagatti. <laughs> that's another. That's another one. You know, and I thought, you know, I think the world is Steve, and I've learned a lot from him, and I've looked at my mentors have been Steve and Big Dan, you know, so. Uh, yeah, you know, we talk about Mario, you talk about Steve, and there have been others that, you know, less less known <laughs> that have had the wrath of <laughs> of Dana. And you're right, Scott Coker is, is an amazing person, and, uh, um, he, you know, but at the end of the day, the assignments uh, have an influence. You know, Mark Ratner will, you know, call up the, the ABC, or the call up Corey Schaefer, you know, at the ISKA, and but there's a core team. There's no doubt about it. There's a core team because when you're that, there's an enormous amount of pressure. If if you're a local ref who's done well, and you know we all have to start out at the smaller shows to get to the big show, but there's an enormous difference when you get there and you're on TV and you're mic'd up and it, it changes everything. It changes everything. So they bring in their 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 big names that they know are are going to handle that. You've got to work your way up to that. So I, I don't think it's a big issue, you know, with going to see a UFC or a Bellator fight and seeing Dan or seeing, you know, the, the usual, you know, Brian Minor or, you know, one of, one of the more regular referees that, um, you know, you got to work your way up there. And you, until you know you've made it when they boo at you. <laughs> it's horrible, but especially if your wife's in the front row and she's saying, I don't know him. <laughs> Um, how do you feel about instant replay getting involved? Again, um, I don't think it should override the referee's decision. Um, it, it's great to to look at a foul, you know, um, from that point of view. But uh, again, the whole the whole sport is is just so quick and fast paced that uh, anybody could be an armchair quarterback and you know look up at the screen and go, you didn't see that punch to the back of the head, you know. It is what it is, and unless it's a blatant, blatant, um, you know, the eye poke and all that stuff, you get to go back and look. I, I, I will neither confirm nor deny being in the back covering an event, and <laughs> might have said that once or twice myself. I'm just gonna yeah. stay on that. Uh, oh, I, so going back uh, with the blow, we're gonna. I don't even know how to phrase this. When the UFC brought in USADA, mm -hmm. it was looked at as a good thing. They, they, they're strict as, you know, hell. Mm -hmm. They're not going to let nothing slide. Other companies not bringing in USADA, and it's still the Wild West. Okay, especially in Japan. One, Ryzen. Mm -hmm. Is, is there a distinct policy that, that, that should go into effect across the board? And, and as a matter of fact, I've even talked to Todd Anderson about the, this, where, where across the board, not only the, through the United States, but around the planet, no PDs whatsoever, just, just cut them right on a dime. And same thing with, with, with a set of rules and not have someone like John or Dan have to go for every event that they go to have to explain to fighters every single rule because every state is different that that is a real 
um, issue that, that we're addressing now that's being addressed. Um, there should be a, a one set of rules, not the old unified rules, the new unified rules, or what has happened in neighboring states where by the third fight, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they have to readdress. Well, the commission didn't say we were using the new, we were going back to the, No, no, it has to be a unified rule, uh, rules uh, across the board. And you're 100% right that uh, even even what we do now at the ISK, and we do the pro and am kickboxing, we do glory. Uh, one of the things I do when you asked about my, my day is to send out the rules. This is what we're going by. Give them to the promoters, send them out to every fighter who signs an agreement to, you know, to know what to expect. As far as a rules meeting, well, at the pro level in MMA, the, the refs are, you know, are going to the individuals and, and explaining what, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and this is what's going to happen, this is what you can expect from me, this is what they expect from you. So from that point of view, I think it's the playing field is leveling off that uh, we're seeing more uni uniformed uh, rules across you know, state to state. I think um, it was an issue, a bigger issue. It's become less of an issue. And people get more comfortable with what we're doing. You know, there was the issue, what's a down fighter? You know, the, the four points of contact <laughs> versus three. You know, they looked at uh, the, the Weidman fight. You know, it, um, you know that, that seems to have settled down. Do you have a Mount Rushmore of kickboxes specifically? That I look, look at and, I mean, you know. Of course, you know, the, the, there are so many. The Bill Wallaces of the world, uh, Jerry Fastfeet, Fontanez, and Corley, and those guys. I mean, currently, um, oh, yeah. And, and you go to Glory, and there's one, one great name there. I'm a big fan of Kevin Van Ostrin. You know, I love, I love watching him do battle because he's so unpredictable and colorful. You know, they, people, champions don't have to win everything. They just <laughs> got to put on a great show. And you know, entertain. They're entertainers. Fighters are entertainers. You know, so. Now, it, when you talk about great kickboxers, mm -hmm. one of I'm not going to say the best ever, but a really, really damn good one struggled a lot in MMA. Joe Schilling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is is there okay? A lot of kickboxers make the transition. Some do good, some do bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But Joe Schilling, for some reason, like, really struggled way over the top struggle. Mm -hmm. is, is there is there some, like, disconnect? No, no it, it, it's, it's not a disconnect. It's just what you're good at. He was just really good at fighting. I mean, I see a lot of guys go into the, the MMA that I, I've known that um, had you know, superior kickboxing skills, and they hoping to to keep it standing up, keep the fight on, you know, from going down to the ground. We mm. see that a lot, and and unfortunately that doesn't always work. And when it goes to the ground, it becomes a very boring fight, you know, because they, they may have some bread and butter skills, but they you know not enough to keep it you know to keep it real. So, yeah, again, but uh, to to that to that point. I think that's why we're we're seeing such an explosion of popularity among glory, uh, karate combat, um, some of the more more you know popular stand up stand up in the Muay Thai world. I've been ref a lions fight with with Brian Mine and Big Dan for the last four or five years. To me, it's the most exciting thing in the world. You never you just from a referee point of view, you got to move these guys up blasting one another with elbows and with with knees and yeah you know, it, it the stand up is probably to me one of the most amazing ways to fight i mean i'm a little too old for the mma from my, my fight days but uh yeah to me it was a lot it's a lot more exciting being able to you know throw that kick out there and looking at the 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 bill wallace's of you know of yesterday that are still at their age or ron van cleef my shidoshi you know, they're just amazing, amazing fighters. See, I'm, I'm more the, the, for a big guy, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard to picture this, but I'm, I'm the more on the ground type guy. <laughs> and I was talking to Stitch Duran about this um, at 
the last World Series of Fighting Card, mm -hmm. uh, John Fitch and Jake Shields. Mm -hmm. And if I can tell you, they had 5,000 at the Hulu Theater. I think 4,999 were just up standing and booing. Mm -hmm. And the one person that wasn't, you're looking at him. Yeah. And I've asked every person that, that, that studies and loves Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. That's what MMA is based in. Mm -hmm. That's its origin. On the ground grappling, that type of style. Why the hell does it not get the respect that... that it, it, does. it does. It does. <laughs> it does. But then the Brazilians are so disciplined in that regard. I mean, if you've ever been into a, a, a Henzo Gracie school or Helsing Gracie or whatever. The, the, the family, the, 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 the respect there, nobody goes out and, you know, blows their horn and whatnot. I think when, when you have a lot of these top fighters in the MMA and whatnot, they've, they've all trained with some of the best ground guys in the world. And, and it's just, just quietness. They just get in there and do their submissions and whatnot. But, uh, but you're right. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to see that kind of bravado and guys jumping up and down you know they, they go 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 to one of these uh have, have you i'm sure you've covered the the grappler's quest and nagas and uh you know the people that are there are amazing i like see it 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 doesn't get the pop that that everything else gets but i don't know I, i've i've always been drawn to it Oh, come on. When I was in college or high school on a wrestling team, only people that ever came were your mother, your father, and your girlfriend. And meanwhile, you'd have the whole school turn out for a basketball game or a football game. Yeah. You know, you're local. This is, that's a good setup. What in the blue hell is it about Bergen Catholic wrestling? <laughs> that every single person I know from Jersey has asked me to bring this up. <laughs> Are they giving their kids like steroids in Bergen? <laughs> no, it's uh, just amazing talent. That it, it, just incredible. It's like a farm system yeah. there. Yes, and, and around the country, I mean, like Arizona State has a big wrestling program. Mm -hmm. This place has, a, and when it goes down to like younger kids, everyone around the country. Look at Bergen Nikki Catholic. Ryan. Look at Nikki Ryan. I mean, a phenom. Here's this kid. And I, I sanctioned uh, Kasai. I went to the, 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 I've done all of them. Nicky Ryan comes out. And here's his, his like 60, 15 year old kid, 16 year old kid, that is matched up against a 30 year old. And he beat him. And this was a 15 minute match. And he trains at uh, Henzo, New York. And you get him on the floor. They have the comp team workout where you have eight, 10 guys. You do eight minutes, minute rest. This kid will beat everybody. Just and he, his parents allowed him, and I spoke to his father about it. Allowed him to drop out of school. He's homeschooled now, so he could train full time. And 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 as a parent and one, I don't know. I really don't know if I, you know, if I have that this one to allow allow my son to drop out of school and homeschool him because he's that great at what he does. But then again, I'm very impressed, and I spoke to the dad, and I was like. And after watching this kid, I was like, yeah, it was a great decision. Now, now, someone in your position, is there an age limit on, on a fighter where you say, you know what? Oh, a little bit well, you? from approving, well, in, in that particular case, you know, it was a little bit different. I mean, obviously, in the MMA, 18, and it, up until then, if we're doing any type of 15 can fight 16, 16 can fight 17, 17 cannot fight 18. So that's oh, that. That's very that's the rule. So uh, <laughs> no, I don't approve anything. <laughs> the reason why um, I've worked a little bit with a company upstate, uh, Ground and Pound Promotions, mm -hmm. with Drew Nolan, mm -hmm. and I really hope to work with him again. Um, but there's there was a bantamweight there, and this kid was he had no nickname, just a thin little tiny mm -hmm. scorner kid. I'm like. This kid's going to get marked. I feel bad for him. As he's walking in the cage, and like a minute five in, he's choking this, this bigger guy out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, holy crap. I, I guess it's really true. You know, you, 
It's not the fight, the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Oh, let me tell you, I, I've, and I train at the, the Henzo's in Brooklyn, I get to go to New York when, when I have time, and uh, the, you know, the, I, I've, I've, been, I've been tapped out by girls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there is absolutely no, no written rule that, uh, you know, size, gender, whatnot, <laughs> uh, talent is talent no matter what. I mean, that's what makes uh, that so amazing as a sport is that it, there's, it's an equal opportunity, you know, humiliator. <laughs> I, I think the, the the probably for me um, the first time I, I went to a seminar with Matt Sarah and I've always liked Matt and I've always been you know he's Long Island the godfather of MMA and our first look up champion you know Matt is Matt but on the I'll never forget um he passed my guard went north and south he put his shoulder on the side of my face I've never and he's not a big guy right. I'm, I'm 220 I've never felt so much weight, and I had no idea how he did it. How the hell did you do that? You know, I thought I thought my jaw was gonna snap. I was, I was so impressed with it. I was like, wow, the the this unnatural strength and speed comes out of this man, and it's just it's just mind boggling. And somebody like Dan to be Severn, another man, until you stand in front of him and you actually grab on, and you realize you've made the mistake of your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so I, I've I've rolled with guys that were you know, a hundred pounds lighter than me, and I've rolled with guys a hundred pounds heavier, and uh, I'm telling you, that's what makes the sport great. Yeah. Now, you guys and the WKN split a while back. Uh, yeah, before my time. Yeah. Do you think the the the, the ISKA would ever again meld into one from from around the planet? Wow, um, I don't think we have to. I, I think you know, Corey's just getting back in from Italy this weekend, and uh, we got there's, there's something every couple of days all over the world. Um, not necessary. I think he's been able to put together an infrastructure of leaders all over the world, and I've been able to draw fighters when I'm, I'm working with a promoter locally and we brought them in from Egypt, we brought them in from Ireland. When somebody wants an ISK world title or an international title or whatever, uh, unlike the local setup where, yeah, you can give away a local belt, you know, XYZ, you know, maybe a guy that sells a lot of tickets, but he's had two fights that they offer him a title. Well, that that's, you know, that's great, but meaningless title, meaningless belt. Um, but to get an ISK title it takes a lot more. So I have the ability to call up Corey, send him an information. This is what I have, guy. This is his record. We're looking, you know, to challenge the person that's holding the belt, and we'll get in touch with one of our directors from anywhere in the world, and we'll work it out so that we can bring that fighter over. And consequently, if a fighter here wins the belt, well, now overseas. They, they they want to challenge them. They'll fly that fighter over. So this has become our currency. You know, the, the, the real prestige of having an ISK title, a real title, that means something. And, uh, you know, you get to go defend it anywhere in the world or we can bring somebody here. So I don't, I don't really think we ever have to need to, to join forces with anybody. I think ISK has proven... You know that they are the 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 leader in what we do. You know. So, but so there is that connection between you guys around the planet. Oh, undou yes, without, without a doubt, without a doubt. That's why, um, even even in countries that don't have an ABC like we have here, you know, they'll bring a Mike Mazzulli, who's the president of the ABC, over to England. They'll bring Corey also, you know, from ISKA. So we're constantly where we have to be anywhere in the world. That's why I was going over to Japan, Karate Combat, did uh, their first one at the Parthenon in Greece, the second one in Miami, the third one we did at the Freedom Tower, and then now we're doing one in, in Japan. So I will go there representing ISKA because we are the ones that uh, train the officials, set the rules up, and, and uh, you know, that's our responsibility in a lot of these Promote promotions that are growing. They want to make sure that this is what we do. You guys do it, and they bring us, and we bring that team with us. 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't, I don't, I'm almost positive on this. Bass Rutan was involved with you guys at the Freedom Tower, or Bass Rutan um, was the uh, the the voice of Karate Combat. Him, ah, and Scott Wheelock, and um, you know Bass. Rutan is probably one of my favorite, favorite people in the world. Nobody makes <laughs> makes you laugh like him. Um, and he's genuinely one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. You know, that just, um, you talk to him, and it's like talking to your best friend. I mean, the guy is just so down to earth, so grounded, and, and just humble at what he does. So, yeah. So he was there, and he's now, he, he's the voice of a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> He'll be back in New York in a in two weeks? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. with PFL. Mm -hmm. um, so out of everything you've done, mm -hmm. from fighting uh, to, to this, if you had a Sophie's Choice and you had to pick one, would you say one's the best? <laughs> you know, that is, that's kind of a, a, a very interesting, to be, an, to be answered honestly, and I've given so much thought to this, um, where if we could do things over, what would we do? And having been in the game for 48 years, um, teaching, training, fighting, whatever, being a referee is probably the, the adrenaline rush to be able to be there, be the third person in the ring. To, to uh, it's something that I, I, as I've got, as you get older, you don't know when to, to kind of stop. You know, unfortunately, that's, you know, when you look at everybody that's out there now, these guys have been doing it since day one. You know, you got the next generation. So um, I like what I'm doing because I can make a difference in the sport that I love. I can really make it better for the promoters, for the fighters, make the sport grow. And uh, so I, I guess, yeah, yeah, I'm always going to, I still ref in other states. I don't do it in New York because I am the New York State Director. But um, I'll, you know, I'll go to Foxwoods or I'll go to Massachusetts or Missouri and be able to do what I love doing. But, uh, yeah, there's something about being, being a ref that is just, to me, um, it's the, the all-time high when I'm doing it. Just being so close to the people that I, you know, that's the bad part. You, you admire these <laughs> fighters. I'm a fan, but you can't be a fan when you're a ref or an official. Yeah, you or a reporter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I gotta tell you, the first the first time credentialed, I was told, "Listen, no hats, no t-shirts, no cheering, no ooing, no aahing, no nothing." Mm -hmm. And to be honest, the the first thing I was credentialed for was uh, the New York Mets mm -hmm. through Jay Horowitz. I was told you gotta act like a professional, and I'm sitting behind Frank DeFord, who mm -hmm. used to run the National, and. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Sid Fernandez is pitching against the Dodgers. By the third pitch Sid Fernandez threw in the top of the first, Frank DeFord was in front of me, pissed drunk. And I looked at my cameraman, and I'm like, well, if I'm told to act like a professional. This is going to be easy. But they're like, no, listen, he can get away with it. You can't. I'm like, that's not fair. And even, even covering MMA stuff. You can't, ooh, you can't, ah, but when you have a crazy freaking knockout, when, when like an Overeem Nganu, when someone mm -hmm. just, how do you not go, huh? how do you, it's a human reaction to guess. Well, if you're a ref, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the other thing that's really tough is you've got to discipline yourself not to take pictures with people. Not, not yeah. you know, that, that'll get you bounced out of being, being, uh, in the UFC you know, or, or Bellator, you, know, you just can't do it, and and it's very difficult. You know, you're with people that that are just you're so uh, amazed at, and you, there's an opportunity. But after the show, you can you can do stuff like that. But uh, the officials, the judges, and whatnot, and you see a lot of it. But uh, and and especially because you know we're fans of this, we're we're blessed to do what we love and love what we do. But uh, you know. Yeah, there's there's always those moments, especially if you're in the middle of the, you get a third man in and something really you're like, oh, yeah, the pity your stomach, you want to bust a heart, <laughs> I, or, or especially like like a low blow and a guy yeah. just yeah, you up can't and help. down crying. You can't help but go, oh, you know. It's human it, It's it's like hitting mm -hmm. your knee and your knee moving up. It, oh, without a doubt. But uh, yeah, you you just you kind of 
hold your breath and just okay. I'm not gonna smile. I'm like yeah, and you can't help but laugh too sometimes. And some yeah, you're in the middle of a rig. And, yeah, you two MMA guys and you're rolling around and one guy farts and you know, <laughs> and you know they're giggling. You know they're, they're beating the hell out of each other. They they yeah, in the middle of this they they just think it's very funny. And you're the third guy there and you've got to not you know, you know <laughs> laugh at it. So see, I was going to ask you about that, but I decided <laughs> not to. So. It's good how you how you answered that last question. Before I let you go, and, and this one's really interesting for me because mm. where you are is something that I would literally give both my arms for. Mm. How does someone get into the into that side of the business? That, that is a great question um, that gets asked a lot, and and I have to laugh because it took me forty eight years. <laughs> so, um, I got I, maybe I just, three, and I'm telling yeah. you right now, the last two are going to be. I'm going to well, be in a lot of pain. So, um, aside from you know, people think you take one of these courses with a Kevin McDonald or Robert Hines or John McCarthy or you know Dan Mergliata, and you sit through and you get your cert of, and and that's great, but unfortunately, that's that's not the pro. That's not the you know the uh, what I use as the you know to hire somebody. Yeah, you know, just because you've got this piece of paper, I'm glad you you took the course, and that's step one. But now you're going to shadow, you're going to watch, you're going to work your way up that from inspector to you know to getting in the uh, in the cage, so we could see how you how you're moving and whatnot. But um, when I started doing it, what I did was I got on every commission I could, wrote to them, got did the application, and then it would cost me a fortune to fly to Missouri to do a show get paid two hundred dollars <laughs> come home it cost me four hundred but you do that to the point where all of a sudden now people start to recognize you realize who you are it's like opening any business starting any you are the business and you're gonna you're gonna dedicate your life to it dedicate yourself to doing it being everywhere getting well known to all of a sudden you know you find yourself doing bigger shows but that's you know you start out doing all the small shows and and enjoying it because you have a lot more fun at the small shows. You know, Do you really? I love it. I, I absolutely. It's like a lot of guys. USA Boxing, which has been part of my life, and I wear my my dad's 1949 gloves around my neck and whatnot. And uh, a lot of guys won't go pro as a as a ref because once you go pro as a boxing ref, you can't do the uh, the Golden Gloves anymore. You can't do the JOs, and that's oh. where you have. The most passion, the most excitement. There's nothing more exciting than the Golden Gloves of, you know, watching these kids get in there, watching, you know, the Mark Breelings. And so you ask any pro boxer, as a journalist, as a, what, what was the greatest moment of your life? What was the greatest win? I, I will guarantee they told they tell you it's the Golden Gloves. There is absolutely nothing more more prestigious than wearing those gold gloves around your neck or silver gloves, you know. But that's that's it. So. You know, you don't want to give that up. I, I wouldn't want to give it up. I wouldn't want to give up being an amateur boxing ref to be a pro. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's great. But, yeah, I, I'm never going to be Arthur McCanty, <laughs> who's a good friend of mine and a great, you know. But uh, I, I look up to these guys. and uh, But I also think, you know, in the, the combat sports, the karate one, I, yeah, that, that's, I'm that, you know, I'm, that, I'm as qualified as the next guy. You know, and that only came from... 15 years of watching and training and doing it, you know, over and over. So pay your dues like anything else. You know. Enjoy doing all the local shows, do them all, and travel, you know, and go upstate. And I, my wife used to laugh at me. I'd get in the car, drive hours to North Carolina to do a show, drive to five hours to, to Massachusetts to do a show. Because you love doing it. That's what we do. Ground and Pound was up in Whitehall, New York, when I was going up there. Mm -hmm. What a trip. Six hours from Brooklyn. Oh, I, I drove up to, to Syria. We had the snowstorm a couple weeks back. The weigh-ins were on Thursday for the Hot Park show from 5 to 7, 9.30. I was still there because guys were trapped on the LIE. And I was like, I'll weigh in tomorrow. No, we're, we're, they couldn't go home. They could, so I stayed, did that. Did the show Friday. Saturday, drove up. Because planes went up to... to uh, Syracuse, 17 was closed because of the snowstorm, and I'm like, oh, this is crazy. Yeah, I'm talking to the guys up in Rochester, you know, it's like, they already got a foot of snow down or whatever, but you do it. You just do it. You laugh at it. Now I laugh. I'm like, I got a Jan 5th show in Syracuse. I can't imagine what the weather's going to be like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it is, if you want to do this, if you want to get to that level, 
Yeah, start now. Just do as many shows as you can. Get on as many commissions, shadow, pay your dues, and make a name for yourself. You also have to have to be good. Right. Yeah, that does help. <laughs> <laughs> it might. I mean, you'll you'll make mistakes, and it happens. And there are times you just want to crawl out of the cage, or climb <laughs> out of the ring. And, but you know what? It is what it is. The, the majority of your stuff is good. People know that. You know, and your heart's in the right place, and your ego is outside the ring. You know, or the cage. That's the most important thing. Just love what you do. Do what you love. Be humble and do as much of it as you can. And that's that's the secret to to getting to the big show. Got to do a lot of little shows to get to the big show. Uh, cool. So. Everyone, Tom Scazzo, I want to thank him so very much for stopping by. It was my honor. It was thank a pleasure. You. Appreciate I'd it. See you at the next show. Yep, definitely. Uh, Bobby will walk you out. Thank that you. That way. I'll show you.